Please give a round of applause, everyone. Thank you, Brooklyn Brother. Uh, can we have a moment of silence because we are um, praying for DMX's health? <laughs> Let us pray. Father God, thank you for, ha um, for allowing us to have another happy, healthy Monday. And this is the first huddle of April, so give that up, y'all. And pray, and pray for those who are sick, and pray for those who are incarcerated, and, let, and pray for, um, for, for George Floyd's um, family who are going through, um, going through this time. And keep um, DMX in, in your prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. And right now we have an announcements and extra alerts by no other than Butter Trayvon. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. First prayer with a hand clap. Making history. <laughs> All right, so this week in our action alerts. I got a little bit of vaccination, so it's okay. I'm going to mask a little bit. Um, earlier this week, Reverend Al Sharpton urged individuals um, from across the country to pause and kneel for eight minutes and 46 seconds ahead of the criminal child of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chavin, who killed George Floyd when he placed his knee on his neck last summer. Um, for those of you who have, have come in by a short answer, I've been keeping up with the trial. All right, each and every day. Be in the know. Make no mistake, there were videos before and justice in the courtroom did not follow, Reverend Sharpton said. Outside the government center, he and attorney Ben Crump had and several members of the Floyd family and legal team, along with activists, Neil, for nearly um, that nine minutes to illustrate the torturous long period that Shaden's knee remained on Mr. Floyd's neck. In another quote, Today starts a landmark trial that will be a referendum on how far America has come in its quest for equality and justice for all, Attorney Krupp said, adding, this murder case is not hard. So in other news, Nan praises the Biden administration on judicial nominations. Judicial nominations announced this week by President Joe Biden are one of the most significant steps toward racial diversity and inclusion in our justice system. Side note, so it's not just the Supreme Court justice that the president gets to nominate. All the federal judges go through the president's office, so voting does matter. Former president, number 45, I think confirmed over 280. So federal judges, standing up. I received this list of nominations while sitting in the courthouse in Minneapolis with the family of George Floyd, said Reverend Sharpton. As we watch the trial proceedings with heavy hearts, it is no doubt an accurate portrayal of where we find ourselves as a country, yet in the context of these nominations, we are reminded of where we could go if we work together to further judicial progress. In other news, register for NAND's convention today. We are celebrating 30 years. How many of you give a round of applause? Keep clapping until the end of this announcement. All right, so how many of you know when the convention is? All right, April 14th through the 17th, that it will be virtual. This year, due to COVID-19, it will be virtual. So for those of you who are not registered, you are more than welcome to do so on nationalactionnetwork.net. You can go to the front desk. We'll help you out with that. You can talk to any amongst the staff members here. We'll get you all set up and squared away with that. April 14th through the 17th, celebrated 30 years of the National Action Network. This year we will celebrate our 30th year by continuing to address our nation's extraordinary crisis in racial justice and connecting to meaningful forms of action. As always, we will strive to address systematic inequalities and advance political education, social and economic equality for our community. More information is to come as the days approach. Stay tuned. And that is all for our action alerts. Now back over to our good host, Lorraine. I don't know where he is. 
We'll take a commercial break. We'll be right behind. Thank you. All right. And for right now, I'll be calling up NAG committee heads for arts and culture, Arnold Bennett. No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! What do we want? Justice! What do we want? Justice! What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! 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 Just talk the person next to you and tell them you love them. And that's what we do every Saturday at the House of Justice. I am Arnold Penix, a.k.a. Gregory Harris, and this is the Nan Arts and Culture uh, segment. Huddle, warm up, rise up, and as you see, we are implementing on Easter Monday. You know, we have a, we used to get Easter baskets, but now we have the bread basket. And the bread basket is a celebration of 30 years of Nan Arts and Culture, and inside the bread basket is food for thought. So I will, and then that's what's in the basket, where we have our history of the National Action Network in this book is here, and we have our fearless leaders, new recent excerpt from that, but I'm going to be training the young people in a new society called the Bread Basket Society, because Reverend Sharpton was youth director for the Operation Bread Basket for SNCC, the Southern Leadership Christian, Christian Southern Leadership, Southern, Southern Christian oh. Leadership Conference. And he was at 14 years old, so what I was asked by the fearless leader, Ashley Sharpton, to train our young people in public speaking. So, we're going to start with this exercise, bring both your lips up like this, and poke them out till it hurts. Like that, that's you give your enunciation. Mmm, there you go. Mmm, poke it out, poke those lips out. It's good for other things, too. Poke your lips out. Now shake it out, shake it out, shake it out, shake it out. Shake it out. Shake it out. Repeat after me, I know I can. I know I can. Be what I wanna be. Be what I wanna be. If I work hard at it, if I work hard at it, I'll be where I wanna be. Where I wanna be. I know I can. I know I can. Be what I wanna be. If I work hard at it, I'll be where I wanna be. Stay in the rhythm, Jesse. I know I can, I know I can be what I wanna be, be what I wanna be. When I work hard at it, if I work hard at it, I'll be where I wanna be. On your feet, soldiers, if we bring our speaker up, come up, young man. On your feet, on your feet, our young man's gonna come up here and he's gonna be our speaker for this afternoon, evening. And uh, so right up on this, please. There we go. All right. He is going to represent the spirit of young Reverend Al Sharpton. And he is going to, so let's just all move in place like this. I know I can be what I want to be. If I work hard at it, I'll be where I want to be. Give yourself a big round of applause and have a seat. Yeah. I see this coming to you. What's your name, soldier? What's, what's your name again? Kwame Walters. Okay, you keep your mask down. And you're going to be reading an excerpt. Our food from thought, we're going to be taking uh, quotes from the book Rise Up by Reverend Dr. L. Sharpton. And that's how you'll be trained in your public speaking uh, tutelage. So, are you ready? Okay, give a big round of applause for us. the premier of the Grand Master Society here at the National Action Network. Huddle up. Uh, bitter, bittersweet or sweet? No defeat. One of the first protests I participated in was with Jesse Jackson. I was 14 years old and we were boycotting AP Market, who refused to hire black workers. Some among us thought our approach should be more militant and rather than boycotting the stores, we should burn them down. The infighting was so intense, it threatened to destroy and protest entirely or worse. They divide, divide us into separate fac factions. I asked Jesse, why, we kept, why do we keep putting ourselves on the line when our own kind kept fighting with us? He said, young buck, if you're not willing to get out there and take the incoming fire, then don't sign up to be in the army. Unfortunately, the incoming fire is sometimes from your so-called allies. I learned from Jesse that it doesn't matter if you pick up your battle, if you pick your battles wisely, you, you can still win the war. Movements and, or, movements and organizations are never perfect. 
for every, for every step forward, there are two backwards and vice versa. That doesn't mean the fight isn't worth it. Adam Clayton Powell, Powell Jr. was fond of quoting Claude McCain's famous poem, If We Must Die. Powell would draw his cigar and in that booming voice of his summon the rally cry. If we must die, let it not be like hogs. Like men will face the murderous cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying but fighting back. We are, we are a country of protesters. We are a country of agitators. We are also a country of tree shakers. There's no other choice but to fight. Otherwise, even on your best day, you're going to be treated like a second class citizen. Bittersweet or sweet, my friend? Except no defeat. Give him a big round of applause. <laughs> the Grand Master Society. No justice. No peace. Huddle up. Thank you. Very inspirational. I think it's that on the Yeah. I think you need that for living. But next time. <laughs> and now for our membership in Texas alert. Is everybody here an updated member for the year of 2021? Have you renewed your membership? Yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> if not, this applies to you as well as those who are not members. The best way to stay informed and in the action is to become a member of NAM. Stay informed about NAM, NAM events close to where you live. Text justice followed by your state to 59769. I repeat, in order to stay informed and in the events close to where you live, text justice followed by your state to 59769. Dr. Reverend Al Sharpton is here every single Saturday to educate us about his journey through our activism. And us as a youth especially, it's very great to be there. And me coming some of the Saturdays, I was able to pick up a lot from him and it was able to motivate me to, to be uh, continuing with my activism work. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And now for our, um, for our good news. Does anybody have a good news? A new Monday, new day. Anybody? Oh, Shannon. So, I have three good news. So, the first good news is that my TikTok um, makeup tutorials that I do on Facebook and Instagram has now reached over 1,000 views. So, I'm now taking requests of what look you guys want me to do, so please inbox me. Second thing, um, so, I've agreed to do a documentary about me, about, where, about my childhood and how my journey is now. So stay tuned, there's gonna be a documentary about me going to you know, be in these kind of filmments. So, and the last one is that, even though I've loved him um, ever since I first got here, but as of Saturday, I symbolically adopt little Marcus out as my little brother. Wow. Because the youth today needs brothers and sisters to look up to and, and have and set a good examples. I mean, sure, he has his uncles and aunts and, and mom and dad and even his grandparents, but his sibling's love is unconditional for, you know, little kids. So that's my little bro. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, really quick, I forgot to announce this in my alerts. I apologize. All right, so the New York City Office of Mental Health, I'm sorry, Health and Hygiene, um, this Saturday, April 10th, from 1 to 2.30 p.m., um, the NAN Disabilities Committee will be hosting a Zoom with, um, in New York City, I'm sorry, the COVID-19 pandemic is a global and shared traumatic experience that disrupts, you know, and affects our families, friends, and communities. So the Name Disabilities Community um, Committee will be um, hosting a Zoom via Zoom with the city's um, mental health and hygiene office uh, that will go and discuss some of those things. For more information, front desk, or um, call the House of Justice 877-626-4651. The Zoom link will also be provided as well on the city's mental health and hygiene website. Thank you so much.
That's what I was coming up here to say. Trayvon's birthday is Wednesday. So let's pick him up, y'all. I just want to say, Trayvon, thank you for everything that you do, especially for me. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. And now for our Black History Fact. Did any of you guys hear of the saying, a person who doesn't know their um, history is like a tree without the roots? Anybody? Well, that's one of the reasons why we have our Black History Facts every day. And today, Black History Facts is presented by no other than Brother Oops. Usma. I want to be told too. <laughs> Okay, as we know, hello guys, how are you? As we know, yesterday was the 53rd anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King. So, can we all have a moment of silence, please, for our great one? More than almost anyone, Dr. King fought to force America to live up to its lofty, often unpracticed ideals. He wanted America to to promise and to honor their promise that they had on paper. He fought for equal rights and justice, not just for black Americans, but spoke eloquently and passionately for the poor and marginalized. When he was gunned down on April 4, 1968, he was busy fighting for the rights of black sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee, because he has learned that we cannot pull ourselves by our bootstraps if we don't have boots. So he was done just fighting for social justice, but he wanted to fight for economic justice. As we remember Dr. King, we must not forget the tactics and strategies he used to push progress forward. Voting rights was one of the main things he fought for, and his efforts helped achieve the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So let's give it up for Dr. King, even though he's not here with us. Therefore, if he would, he would, if he was still here, be denouncing the blatantly racist Republican voter suppression bill that was just signed into law by Georgia Governor Brian Kemp. Last week, the King Center and Dr. King's family wrote the following open letter to lawmakers and corporate leaders regarding the voter suppression efforts of Georgia Republicans. They said that Dr. Martin Luther King said, evil cannot permanently organize. It bears within it seeds of its own demise. This belief undergirds our abiding faith in America, even as legislators in Georgia and 39 other states attempt to root. Thank you very much, and this is our Black History Fact of the Day. And now, for our Did You Know, by Brother Philip. Woo! Yes, sir. I got the chair for you too, by the way. Oh. I'm seven feet, I don't need that move. Okay, so I'm just gonna be stating the, the facts. I won't be going straight to the whole thing. First, I want to start, they call the chief. By the way, he's the first black uh, police chief of Minnesota, uh, Chief Arondo Dondu. Um, they called him to the stand. And while he was there, he said that the, Mr. Chavin has failed to follow the, uh, the procedures and had a use of force that was not necessary for Mr. F for Mr. Floyd. And he has said himself that George Floyd's death was a murder. After that, they also called the doctor. The doctor pronounced George Floyd's death was because of a lack of oxygen. And that for 30 minutes before um, that, he would, 30 minutes after preceding death, that's when they found out. Dr. Langfield noted that, the, that beginning CPR as soon as possible is critical for the patient who was in cardiac arrest. And as George Floyd, no one before before the ambulance was called, was giving CPR to Mr. Floyd.
Mr. Chavin's uh, lawyer has suggested that Mr. Floyd was caused in part of his undermining heart disease and overdose that was fine in his system. And reason to question for Mr. With, with Dr. Fields arguing that many different things, including taking drugs and have caused a death that caused Mr. Floyd's death. So my question for you guys is, do you think, my, my question for you guys is, why is there such a big push on questioning the doctor even though he has a whole degree? Why is there such a book questioning on the doctor on the death of George Floyd? but I think this is kind of a way for for him to justify of why um, um, they, they choke, they, um, he um, had his knee on his neck or something like that. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's just their way of justifying um, that, oh, he was just doing his job and he just so just so happens to um, just lose, uh, lose conscience and Die, which I think is ridiculous because there shouldn't be no question he shouldn't have had his knee um, on his neck for, um, for no eight minutes and 45 seconds. So, yes, yeah, that's that's why um, that's why I think um, why they're why they're questioning the doctor just to have some type of way to justify what he did. So also, Attorney Hardy will be here uh, soon. So when he comes up, we can always constantly ask him more questions about the case and stuff. Okay. Hope you have fun up there, Philip. So, today we have a special pre uh, presentation by two special guests. Can any of you, uh, can any of you guys guess who's the special guest? Yeah. Me. Yeah. Nah. So our special guests are Anthony Doshi and Dr. Guilford, and they'll come up and I'll give them the mic for them to present themselves. Oh, all right, they have the mic already. Oh, all right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Yutaro. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening Yutaro. Good evening. Thank you for allowing us to present tonight. My name is Dr. Tawani Gilford, and this is Anthony Dosey. Many of you have seen Anthony Dosey, and I've been here on a few occasions. We also have another presenter, um, Ibrahim Barry, and he's going to zoom in um, from Sierra Leone. So that's a special treat that we have. Uh, and we formed the Stop Cold Police Reporting Group because of our common themes and our stories. We were all impacted by false reporting where an individual or police officer filed a false report and it led to some dire consequences in each of our lives. As you will see later on and throughout the presentation that our lives have been irreversibly impacted by false reporting. Um, and some of those cases are still going on some have been somewhat resolved, but we have banded together. We formed a, a group and have been advocating for each other in many different ways because we found that there are strength in numbers that singularly we can make a small difference, but together we can make some greater impact to the point where people are starting to notice that filing false reports is a problem. So we're here today because we want you to see that filing false reports, as we call it, weaponizing false reports against another individual is a problem. And we need legislation to help us. And we also need for law enforcement to scale back on these policies and these practices that allow uh, the weaponization and the falsification of false reports to persist in our lives because they have detrimental effects. So we're gonna start 
and we'll, we'll take the time out to introduce Ibrahim Barry, and you'll see his story. And the way it's going to go is you'll see our video, and then we'll talk about our stories. And then at the end, you'll have time for question and answer. Because Ibrahim is calling from Sierra Leone, we're actually going to show his video, allow him to speak about his story, and everyone will have the opportunity to ask him questions before we end, wrap up his session. So without further ado, we'll show Ibrahim's story. Again, he's back. currently in Sierra Leone. Barry is trying to cope with the deportation of her son, Ibrahim Barry, to Sierra Leone. It's not just that he was sent out of the U.S., but how it happened. His lawyer says Immigration and Customs Enforcement deported Ibrahim under a different identity. He was rushed out of the country uh, with a document that um, is, there's no dispute that it's been highly problematic, you know. That's one way to look at it. We looked at it and, and would have said that it was falsified. Sierra Leone initially refused to admit him, but the U.S. would not take him back. So now Ibrahim Barry is a man without a country, in limbo, he says, because Sierra Leone refuses to issue him the papers he needs to work and travel. We spoke to him by Skype. And none of the documents that I have will help me get an ID, ID card. You can't get a job, can't move around. Everywhere you go, you are asked for identification. Ibrahim was 10 when he and his family left Sierra Leone to seek asylum in the U.S. He got his green card, but it was revoked after he was convicted of armed robbery. After his release from prison, Ibrahim was ordered to check in with ICE every four to five months. Then President Trump took office, and such cases took on a higher priority. Ibrahim was ordered to begin checking in monthly, and in the spring, ICE swooped into his Harlem apartment and deported him July 11th. You shouldn't be able to exile somebody to a country where they, that country's not accepting them as, as a national or citizen. The problem is, ICE deported Ibrahim Barry under the name Ibrahim Moy Barry, spelling his first and last name differently and giving him a middle name while putting his birth date as February 1st, although he was born on December 10th. I was told basically since uh, the complications of the name that because that person is now considered as a San Leone citizen is very difficult that, that everything must be uh, straightened out before I could be able to before they be able to buy me. Identification card. Ibrahim is married to his high school sweetheart, Harlem native Janique Nelson, and together they have a two year old girl. New York One caught up with her as she prepared to move last week with their daughter to Sierra Leone. She just quit her job as a postal worker. There's nothing that we can do without out of our hands. We're trying to get help as much as we can, but I don't want to fight it out there with him. We're going to stay together as a family. Ibrahim's attorney calls the case an example of the government running roughshod over procedures and protections to increase deportations. And if it's happening to Mr. Mr. Barry in this situation, it's probably happening to hundreds of other people that we will never hear about. The Department of Homeland Security says in court documents that it's Ibrahim or someone representing him responsible for the inaccurate information in the deportation documents. The agency also blames immigration officials in Sierra Leone for miscommunication. Michael Hertzenberg, New York One. So now, oh, this on? So now we're going to have Ibrahim uh, Barry uh, tune in uh, from Sierra Leone. In just a moment. Okay, here we go. Yes, yes, I'm in.
Good evening, Abraham. It's very good to see you. Hi. We're here in Harlem in New York City. This is the Youth Huddle group. Uh, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself to everyone, say hello, and just share a little bit about your uh, story. Thank you, Abraham Berry. Hello, yes, good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is, my name is Ibrahim Barry. I'm calling currently from Sao Leone. I'm trying to focus on the Star Force Police Report. Uh, about force report from officers, which actually I believe triggered um, my deportation to Sao Leone which is, I was illegally deported here by, by someone else's identity. And would, there would be a video played basically to explain more and furthermore into the story. Yeah, Ibrahim, you actually played the video first, and then we have mm -hmm. the objection. Okay. So I don't know. Um, no, so that, that basically... Okay, so the video, you know, it, it, it tells itself. You know, I was, um, I was sent here. I was deported here by someone else's identity, as you can see. Um, my name is Ibrahim Barry, and the documents and identity he was sent me here was Ibrahim Boy, or different identity of birth and, and, and executive and so forth. But I'm pretty sure. Um, some of you guys have some questions you probably want to ask because you guys watched the video already, so I'm not going to take up too much time. So does anyone have any questions for Ibrahim? Yes, I can hear you, hear you a little bit. Can, can you hear me now? Speak up a little. Can you hear me now? Yes, 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 I do. Hi, I'm Ibrahim. I'm Ocean. I'm from one of the huddlers from here. Um, I'm calling from Sao Leone. Can you hear me now? Oh, so um, my question is that um, what was your first initial feeling when you was first um, sent to um, Sierra Leone? Um, I was, I was ordered to remove, I was under the order of removal from, um, when I was a teen. I, I had made some bad decisions when I was a teenager, um, and I was ordered to remove from them. So they have attempted a few times to remove me, but, uh, they didn't succeed at removing me under my, my real name, my, my real alias, which is Ibrahim Barry, and I was released on my own supervision, and I was basically reporting back, to, back and forth to immigration. And I was a green, I'm a green card holder, and also married to you know, a U.S. citizen. My wife is a U.S. citizen, and my daughter is a U.S. citizen, my mom's. So I'm a green card holder. But just because, you know, just like most of us uh, teenagers, you know, when we are caught up in um, the illusion in this uh, so-called life, uh, I made some terrible decisions, I made a terrible decision. And which um, came to affect me later on in the future when I was least expected. Uh, because after after my release from prison, I had, um, moved forward with my life. I was going to school, got married, had a daughter, so I was just more so focused on uh, building a future for myself. And I was also building um, a record label. Um, I had an artist. At, Excuse me. Yeah, um, it was a call I interrupted. I had an artist. Yes. Um, I had an artist I was managing, and so I was just focused on you know moving forward and, and building a future. But I mean, something unexpected you know, took place in my in my life. And you know the journey just gets deeper. Thank you. Can 
connection is a little spotty over there, and it's five hours ahead over there. So we might get him back, we might not. So let's have a round of applause for Ibrahim Barry. You know, he's got a very courageous story, and Dr. Tawan and I, uh, we are advocating for his case, and we are looking for uh, a, a legal team to help uh, investigate or, or reinvestigate his case and see how we can overturn it because we believe that he did not get fair due process. So we're trying to get him back to the United States to reunite him with his mother, his wife, and his, his daughter. Okay, Abraham. Yeah, sorry about that interruption. So Ibrahim, would you like to tell us what what prompted the actual deportation? Like once you came back, you got your life back on track. Um, let would you like to let these folks here know how did you end up having an interaction back with the system? How did you get caught up again? Um, basically, I was a passenger in a vehicle that was uh, stopped by undercover officers and detectives. Uh, basically, the probable cause was, they so-called say it was uh, excessive tinted windows. You know, they stopped the car, and um, I was a passenger. They asked for um, license registration, but we first asked them what was the reason for the stop. They said excessive tinted windows, uh, which was not the case, because you can, you can see through the uh, you can see through the windows. It's not limo tents. It's light tents, and you can actually see through them. But anyway, so they stopped the vehicle. We asked why the officers didn't like the you know the reason why we asked them questions, and then it was uh, you know a Latino and, and black and, and black black men and men of color in the car. So they was into form of that. And um, so, in the process of looking for the uh, vehicle documents, um, there was a plaque inside the inside the glove box, a uh, parking plaque. So the detective that was on my side, he asked for me to. Um, he asked what was that. I told him that nah, that's irrelevant, and he asked me if I worked for the city. I told him that's is irrelevant to the stop. You know, you stop this, it's a traffic stop, not anything else. So he didn't like the response, and he got very, you know, hostile and snatched up with my door, trying to snatch me out the car. So later on, they charged me um, with, with resisting arrest and forged instrument and excessive tunnel windows. And like I said, I was, I was a passenger, so I wasn't supposed to be, I was not supposed to be charged with anything, because is I'm a passenger. They was they were, they're not even supposed to talk to me. But because I was on parole at the time, they used parole to um put pressure on me and make me take a, a plea bargain of um, a fine, which I believe triggered immigration more to further look into my face and uh, do anything within their means to remove me from the country then and that's when they came up with, uh, with this identity of Ibrahim Moy because they, they didn't succeed with Ibrahim Barry before. Because before they, I was released, before I was released from prison, I was released into immigration custody. I was only in custody for seven months pending removal. And I was released into my own custody, my own supervision. And I was reporting to them for almost four years, almost five years. And that's when I was working on building my future. Yes. Do you think this was on purpose, or like, do you think they, like, well, when they signed your papers under another man's name and another person's date, do you think that was purposely so they could say you don't have the proper papers to stay in the U.S., or do you think that was just a mistake or something? 
I believe I'm not actually sure, but you know, the the, the, the that that depends on the narrator, uh, the person that you can either say is to say the person will have papers, or it's just to remove remove me from the system. Period, because I had I had a um, and we had a case with my wife that filed for me. The case was in court, and that got approved when. I was when I was in San Leon, so our marriage thing was approved for as recognized. So all of that was in court for two years prior before it to being approved. So it depends on how um, you look at it. You know, I have thought of many things, but I'm not. I don't really want to say which one, which one it is, or not too sure. Tell us where did this happen? Where did the, the, the this arrest happen? Because I, I think a lot of people in here may be questioning where did this type of arrest happen? What's that? Where did it happen? Where did the arrest happen? It happened, and it took place in Harlem. Oh, oh right here. On 135th Street, um, Frederick Douglass. That's right there. No, Adam, yeah. Adam Clint. Adam so, Clinton. I'm so sorry. Is that Adam the 32nd Precinct? Or 7th Avenue. Um, I don't exactly where Was that near, near the 32nd Precinct? Okay. Yeah, it was from the um, 32nd Precinct, yes. So, my last, my last question is, a lot of us generally don't know about the deportation process. Usually once a person is out of the country, we never hear about them again. So we're pretty fortunate tonight that we have the opportunity to hear your story. We're, we're very, very fortunate in this room that we have an opportunity to hear from you. So can you, can you describe for us what that immigration process was like? Because we can only imagine that it was an ordeal for you. So can you briefly tell us what that process was like? Once you got to Sierra Leone, what that was like? Can you, can you Describe like how did they treat you? How did immigration officials treat you once you got there? What was it like for you to become familiar with the culture there? Because you, you're, I, I I'll, I'll share with everyone. I've known Ibrahim since he was 11. He was my brother's best friend. Oh wow! To me, I've only known him to be an American. So he's only known America. So he was literally dropped in a foreign place. What was that like for you? I mean, it was, <laughs> it was like, um, I'm sorry, I'm laughing, but it's, it's, it's really tough, it's really tough. And I like to say is, what I like to say is I'm, I'm fortunate, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have been able to, you know, speak a, a, a language, a, the language, that some people understood, and that kind of helped um, my survival of uh, tactic mode kick in. So when when I was born here, and you know, not familiar with anything or anybody, you know nothing. Only thing I knew was the language, and um, which that helped me like uh, navigate, you know, through. Um, in the country a, a little bit. You know, if not, I would have been lost you know, like like other people. You know, because um, there's some other individuals here that um, I had the you know, um, opportunity to meet with that is also sent here that's not from here, you know, illegally by um, under the Trump administration. So I say I'm fortunate to have been able to speak the language to be able to communicate with some with some of the people in the in the country and that helped my um my settlement a little bit. But it's, it was very difficult. It's very difficult, you know, as to speak. It was a big challenge. It's a big challenge. I got it very much. Yeah. Uh, my name is Usman Diallo and my question to you is how being a black man having gone through both the criminal justice system 
and the immigration system, what advice do you have to young people like yourself going through both of these systems? I didn't, I didn't hear the last part. Many, what advice, many, what advice would you have for individuals, young individuals going through both of these systems? The advice. Going through the system. Like something I would tell myself. You know, um, when we get ourselves caught up in the system, which is already set against us, You know, we, like, uh, I'm sorry, I have to take my time before I, I say the wrong thing. Why do you want to take your time? <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's very hard, it's very hard. It's not, it's not, once you're already trapped in the system, it's, it's hard to, 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 like, to find a way out because everything in the system and outside of the system is set to trap us. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Um, I hope you, you understand what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, yeah, man, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, what I'm saying is so, everything is, is set to trap us. So I just say you have to listen you have to listen more, you know, and and watch and read. Good evening, how are you? Good evening, good evening, sir, how are you? Good evening, yes, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you for asking me. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. These are not my questions, but it was presented to me. And the first question is, is um, I'm going to read you all the questions and you're going to answer them as you choose. Um, no problem. Sure, thank you. The first one is, what will it take to rectify your issue? That's number one. The second one okay, is... Okay, one... Go ahead, you, you want me to go all at one time, or how would you like to... Yes, do one, yes, yes, one at a time. Okay, yeah. Um, one, um, to rectify my issue, uh, um, I need a pardon. Mm. No, pardon, not from what took place recently, but what took place in my... Um, in my teenage years, because that's that's what they actually like try to hold over my head. That's why I said, you know, outside and inside the system, we it's set for, to to trap us. You know, so even even once you're in the system and you're working your way out, it's traps already set. So that's one of the first things I would need. Okay, um, my next question is, is Sierra Leone your original home? That is his original home, no? I mean, West Africa is my original home because my, my family originally come from the West African part. Okay, and um, do you have any type of documents to prove your true identity? Yes, I have some that's still uh, available in my possession. And lastly, from the questions that were presented to me, and I have one of my own a few times to mix it, um, under what name were you originally practiced? Um, Ibrahim Barry, the name that you see on the screen. That's my name. Okay, and my question is, do you have any relationship with any of the elected officials over here that you can get to help champion your cause? Um, no, I don't have, no, I don't have that relationship with uh, those elected officials on that side yet. We're working on building a relationship with some officials. Well, I guess you got us right now. You got the youth model on your side. Thank you for your time. Hey, Mr. Barry, I just want to say, first of all, it's completely courageous. People here in America always tell us, um, go back where you come from. I couldn't yeah. imagine being dropped off in Africa, never yeah. living there a day in my life, and having to endure what you've endured. But I was wondering, do you have somebody there that you're like, any family or someone that you're staying with? Like, how are you? 
What kind of haven do you have there? Um, I am, I am no, I am, like I said, what saved me is basically being able to speak the language. That's what saved me. <laughs> so if I didn't know how to speak the language, I would be out here stranded. Um, but being able to speak the language and having family and financial family support and of close friends and you know from the states from over there back in the states with, with the support, um, I was able to be able to live on my find a place to be able to live on my own and not live with anybody and or live under someone else. So because I was able to speak the language, I was able to utilize the language and the support of the family to be able to navigate through the country. Well, I just wanted to let you know that you're definitely in my prayers, and this is my first hearing about your case, but I'll definitely be keeping up with it, and I pray that you get the justice that you do deserve, and God bless you. Thank you. That's all the questions we have for tonight. Thank you, Ibrahim. We'll pass it back to our folks. Okay, thank you very much. About the word. Thank you, everyone. So you can see that uh, Ibrahim is in a very, very uh, precarious situation that. Uh, you know, deported him to a country that he doesn't belong to, that he's not from, with no family, no friends. And try to imagine going to a country you're not from with no identification, no way to apply for a passport or employment. So basically you become like a homeless person, you know, with no identity. And that's what we're working on to try to get Ibrahim back to this country and why false police reporting is such an important issue that we must deal with. Okay? So now we're going to turn our attention to Anthony Dosi's case, who was also um, the victim of false reporting. Uh, his story is that he was, he had 31 reports called on him by his property manager. He was placed in handcuffs take, um, 10, 11 times and taken off to the hospital 8 times. Because his property manager decided that he did not belong in the building that he lived in. And this was an ongoing case for over a year. Ultimately, the case that she brought up against him, which she charged that Anthony had made a threat to kill her. This was an ongoing case for over a year. And ultimately, the charges are dropped. So we are going to turn our attention to Anthony's video, into Anthony, and I'm going to allow him, or he's going to actually take the mic <laughs> and tell his story. Thank you, Tawana. Thank you. Um, the video that you're about to see was uh, uh, secretively shot inside of 20th Precinct Police Station. Uh, shortly after I was arrested on the public street while protesting Dorchester Tower, which is a building that I used to live in on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. My husband and I, we lived there for about three years until a new property manager started working there. And she singled us out, she didn't like us, and she didn't want us living there. So, um... <laughs> so, um, the property management office filed 31 police reports against my husband and I as a form of harassment. 31 times the police, we had contact with the police department, and out of those 31 times, I was placed in handcuffs, taken to jail, or to Bellevue Hospital. 
and uh, ultimately the criminal charges were uh, dismissed last year, um, but the, uh, the damage was done. You know, we were dragged through a criminal court case for uh, a, a year, and after it was over, you know, the, we did not get a reason why the case was dismissed. And I, I believe that when a case is dismissed, the defendant should have the right to know why it's being dismissed to see where the culpability uh, lies. So now we're going to take a look at uh, my, my video shot in 20th Street Precinct Station. This is Anthony Dolce, and as you can see, I am inside the police, police station. Uh, I just got arrested uh, about 15, 20 minutes ago in front of uh, Dorchester Tower. I was uh, peacefully protesting and working on my protest signs on the public sidewalk. <clears throat> and uh, I was not causing any trouble and the police came and they put me in handcuffs and they brought me here and said something about uh, the building said that I was uh, threatening someone's life or something, you know. So because there is nothing, uh, you know, they dangerous person but as you can see I'm pretty calm sitting here and I'm not even in handcuffs right now. The, uh, the arresting officers were okay, the detectives were uh, polite and respectful to me and uh, they say I'm not going to uh, go to jail tonight, they're going to give me like a ticket. But they are going to fingerprint me and later I will have to appear before a judge to answer to this uh, in my opinion, a false allegation, because, uh, you know, I, I know I can be pretty uh, <laughs> loud and ferocious sounding, but um, I know that I've never made any threat to anyone, you know. So anyways, uh, thank you for your attention, and hopefully this will all work out, and the truth will come out about about uh, Ogden property doing what they're doing right now. They're abusing the 911 and uh, system and the police force to uh, wage a personal vendetta against me and my husband. Well, all right, thank you. You know, that, that still brings tears to my eyes and really uh, to you know, relive this moment, you know, what I went through, you know, to be taken away from my family, my only family that I know, 10 times. And you should really think about your family. If someone took your family member away and handcuffs for a crime or accusation that they didn't commit, because they suffer too. Your family, your loved ones also are impacted by this type of crime. Police came to our pri private residence where we were renting an apartment 24 times in a two month period of time. And uh, basically, the police would say, Well, someone from the building said you're acting unstable. So we're going to take you to Bellevue Hospital for a psychiatric evaluation. And I, I would have gone with them uh, peacefully had they asked me. So putting me in handcuffs was completely unnecessary. And the police had come there so many times and we were so fearful for our lives, fearful for our safety, that there were some times I was scared to even open up the door knowing that the police were behind there. And when I didn't open up the door fast enough, on two occasions the police in full riot gear with battering rams broke down my front door simply to terrorize my husband and I because we would not 
We, re we refused to move out of this apartment and we were fighting back the eviction process. So a lot, a lot of times the accusation was that I'm acting unstable. Well, I can tell you that I was not, I was not myself. I was, I was fearing for my life. So you can imagine that I was not acting 100% normal under these type of very scary circumstances. She didn't like us, she didn't want us there, and you know, I believe that it's mostly because I'm very flamboyant, and I'm openly gay, and I'm not in the closet. And that's how some, some people like their gays, they like them in the closet, and hiding who they are, and that's not me. And no one should be judged for their differences, or their sexuality, or their religious beliefs, or the color of their skin. And anyone who does that, we, sh we need to stand up against it each and every time we do that. Hi, I have a question pertaining to the process. Um, what is Okay, so everyone has a right, a legal right, and they get a public attorney assigned to them when they get arrested. Uh, uh, and then you can also later, if you can afford it, you can maybe hire uh, an attorney. Some attorneys may uh, do it on um, uh, special circumstances or on for pro bono. Okay, so uh, another question relevant to what you said in terms of your case being dismissed. Generally, my um, expectation would be that a lawyer would put an emotion to dismiss your case. Did that happen? That's exactly what happened. So after a year of this case of going on, the judge kind of got a little fed up with this thing going on so long. So my attorney did what's called a 30-30 motion. And that kind of forces the hand of the prosecutor to answer to an omnibus report, which is like a, a document with a whole bunch of uh, questions to turn over to uh, to my side and to get ready for uh, for trial, and I I turned down uh, four plea bargains over the year because I knew I was innocent and I know that I never threatened to kill anyone. 
So I kept saying that, you know, no, I, I, I turned down the, uh, the plea bargains. But, but ultimately, the judge said, you have two months to the prosecutor. And when it was two months went by, they said, we're going we're gonna to dismiss the case. Okay, with that final dismissal, isn't it possible that because your lawyer put in a motion, a 30-30 motion or whatever type of motion to dismiss, that the judge granted your attorney's motion because of the reasons given for a dismissal. So in some way, I suspect that you will get an idea of why your case was dismissed based on the papers that your lawyer filed in your favor. Well, 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 actually, that's not true. What happens, you get this tiny little slip of paper, and all it says is your case was dismissed due to a 30-30 motion. That's it. That's it. And one of the provisions in our, in our uh, initiative addresses that issue. Because if you're truly innocent of, of that crime that you're being accused of, if your case is dismissed, the defendant the victim, the you know, the wrongly accused should have the right to know uh, what was the reason why it was dismissed. Was it because of the accuser? Was it because of insufficient evidence? Was it lack of supporting evidence? You know, these are all uh, factors in that. Thank you very much for this. Everybody Thank you. Have a good one. Closing statements. So thank you everyone for your attention. Um, I'll, I'll just be brief. My brother was wrongfully convicted um, for a crime that he did not commit. Uh, and he is currently serving a six year sentence. Um, we are still waiting to get him out of prison now. Um, so we have formed our committee to combat false police reporting. We actually have a petition uh, on change.org if you type in Stop False Police Reporting, you'll learn about our stories. We have a rally this upcoming Sunday uh, at One Police Plaza at 1 o'clock, and we hope to see you all there. At the rally, we will tell our stories. Um, of course, Ibrahim won't be here, but his wife will be here um, to talk about his story, and Anthony and I will talk about our stories at the rally. You'll learn more. Um, on our Facebook page, Stop False Police Reporting, you'll actually see the videos about our stories. And that way you can learn about um, my brother's case. His name is Tyreek Gilford, T-Y-R-E-I-K. You can Google his name to see his actual video, which is right there. Um, it's a five minute video, five minutes and I think about 27 seconds. And in that video, you'll see his journey, like his last days before his uh, incarceration. We are currently pushing to get him released because in addition to his wrongful incarceration, in the prison there's also false, um, false reporting by the corrections officers. So false reporting is multi-layered. It is layered um, by civilians reporting against other civilians and it's also layered with cops reporting against other vulnerable people. So we are pushing for legislation. We are pushing our lawmakers. That was one of the questions that came up in the audience. Who are our lawmakers? Who are our elected officials who can help us? And those are really great questions because we actually need laws changed because currently there are no laws out there that give teeth to false reporting. There is currently a bill that was introduced by Kevin Parker and in the state senate and Diane Richardson in the assembly uh, and it's a false reporting bill and it protects individuals, but it has no teeth in the sense that it doesn't explicitly state that false reporting is a crime and it will be punishable by a felony conviction if you do it. So we have to have dire consequences for people who weaponize false reporting because we need deterrence. So we are asking for your support. We are asking for you to write your lawmakers or speak to your legislators about the importance of making it a crime that will stick. Because we are three people whose lives were impacted, but we are three people who are not afraid to speak out. There are so many people that are afraid to speak out, so many people who do not have the level of advocacy 
some people who will not walk into a National Action Network and have their needs met because they were afraid, right? So we have put our lives on the line to bring this issue to the forefront. If you know of anyone who needs this level of support, please feel free to send them to Anthony, whom you see every week here at National Action Network, and we will be happy to support whatever cause that they have. Um, because we meet every Sunday to be a support for each other because we need it continuously and we like to support other people because it is a scary process, especially when you're going against law enforcement to point out the things that they're doing that hurt other people. We are not anti-cop and I want to make that emphatically clear here. We are not anti-cop. We, we have a gun violence problem. We have a crime against women. Uh, we have a problem of abuse against elderly people. We have a problem against people just walking down the street, right? And people need protection. So we are not anti-cop. We are just against cops who need to falsify documentation to secure an arrest. There is more than enough crime that is happening out there that cops could actually be effective for. There is absolutely no need to falsify documentation because as Anthony stated, incarceration impacts lives. It doesn't just hurt the person, it, it impacts the entire family and I am a testimony to that. My brother is not just arrested by himself. The whole family is incarcerated with him. So please remember, we need legislation. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, now we're going to show a video of, uh, nope, sorry. Oh, we're going to show a video of Reddit during dinner. Thank you very much. Everybody give it up. Now I'd like to direct it back to our Let's go. So now I'd like to welcome Philippi to continue the explanation of the case around the Aaron Gardner's case. Please give him a round of applause again. Well, actually, I'll be bringing up a specialist who is watching this case directly, Attorney Harding, who's in the house right now. So please come up to the stage. I would like for him to just really speak about the case and explain why they're questioning uh, the doctor and why it's so important that the chief is on the stand speaking against this. Come on, y'all, another round of applause. Uh, I gotta be at the podium? <laughs> Uh, sorry, correction. Um, he mentioned the Eric Gardner case is actually the George Floyd trial that we're going to... Sorry, brother. All right. All right. Well, I can do both. <laughs> that's what, that's what. Um, well, listen, let's start. You know, the, the, the Derek Chauvin trial, and Derek Chauvin is the police officer who, well, I assume everybody here has seen the video of the killing of George Floyd. Is that right? Anybody not seen any videos of that? All right. So everybody saw the videos, and from the videos, uh, there's, there's no dispute that Derek Chauvin was the officer who had his knee on the neck of George Floyd. And we now know that he had his knee on the neck of George Floyd for over nine minutes, um, which is what uh, the medical examiner today basically said is what killed him. Uh, now, um, let me back up. We've seen what happened to George Floyd before, because everyone has also seen the video of the death of Eric Garner. And in essence, there's really 
not a lot of difference uh, between those two videos. I mean, obviously, Eric Garner was, and I know his son is here, and so I don't want to bring up traumatic memories for him, but Eric Garner was choked to death. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, that video is almost 11 minutes of a struggle there that killed Eric Garner. Now, Eric Garner's case was very different because the prosecutors who were prosecuting that case failed to get any indictments at all, and the federal government failed to intervene. Right, right. And it was very disappointing to a lot of people uh, because there was no argument that really could be made that there was not justification under federal law for the federal government to take that case. And as many of you may know, and it became public, that there was, and of course this was during the Obama administration for the most part, there was a dispute that became public between the, for lack of a better term, I'm just going to say between the local federal prosecutors uh, who were in what's called the Eastern District of New York, which covers Brooklyn, Queens, Long Island, and a bunch of counties upstate, and the prosecutors in Washington, D.C. from the Justice Department. And the people that were leading the investigation from Washington wanted to go forward and believe that they had the legal evidence to pursue an indictment and get a guilty verdict. The prosecutors in Brooklyn or in the Eastern District uh, resisted that. And the Eastern District is headquartered in Brooklyn. So when I say Brooklyn, I'm, I'm talking about the Eastern District, which covers a broad uh, swath of uh, New York State area. So at the end of the day, there was an election that happened, of course, and the Obama team was out, a new team came in, and eventually the federal government informed the Garner family that that case was not going to be prosecuted. And all of you, and many of you, were involved in that. And then that transitioned, of course, into the fight to get uh, the officer terminated, eventually, which they did. Now, soon after that new administration came into office, um, in fact, it was, I guess, basically during the winter of 2019, the end of 2019, and the beginning of 2020, we all became aware that this, there was this growing pandemic called the COVID-19 virus that began in, impacting and in, infecting the world. In the middle of that pandemic, or at the height of that pandemic, is when Derek Chauvin was killed in May of 2020. I mean, uh, <laughs> Derek Chauvin was the, uh, is the defendant when George Floyd was killed by uh, Derek, Derek Chauvin. And in that situation, the Attorney General of the state of Minnesota uh, became a special prosecutor in the case, basically assumed the jurisdiction of that case, because normally, again, in situations like that, uh, in different counties in, in the state of uh, Minnesota or within the city of Minneapolis, um, you have local prosecutors. In New York City, most of those local prosecutors are referred to district attorneys. And in fact, in New York, we're state, we're going to have 
new district attorneys elected in June all over the state. And there will probably other district attorney races that are happening across the country. Uh, but you have local district attorneys. So, for instance, in the Araguana case, the district, the local district attorney that had jurisdiction on that case was in Staten Island, which is Richmond County. In other cases, you know, the the local prosecutor may have been in Manhattan, which is New York County, or in Brooklyn, which is Kings County, or in Queens which is also Queens County, and the Bronx, which is also the Bronx County. Um, in this case, and you have a similar structure in Minnesota and in Minneapolis. So in this case, the process happened where the Attorney General became a special prosecutor and assumed jurisdiction of that case. And that can happen. Of course, in New York State, many of you may remember that originally Governor Cuomo had signed a law, an executive order, making the Attorney General in New York State a special prosecutor in all situations where there was a police-civilian encounter and the civilian was unarmed. Uh, in Minnesota, there was a different process for uh, allowing the uh, state attorney general uh, to take over the case. And the state attorney general is black and had been a congressperson uh, representing uh, Minneapolis in the past. So about two weeks ago, uh, basically, the trial of Derek Chauvin began. And... <laughs> To everyone in the world, you, you sit and wonder, well, why are we having a trial? <laughs> all you have to do is, all you got to do is look at the video and say, absolutely, Derek Chauvin killed Derek Garner. No dispute. They really, what is their trial for? Well, you know, in America, and, you know, it could be, um, you know, sometimes people say, well, why? Why is there a trial in this case? Well, you know, anybody that is accused of a crime, as we just heard, they have an absolute right to a trial. That's right. Yeah. And not only do they have an absolute right to a trial, they have the absolute constitutional right to a presumption of innocence. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, you'll see situations where me or you may get arrested, like in some of the discussions we heard earlier, and say, oh, you know, <laughs> we've been falsely accused. We've been arrested for no reason. We're innocent, and we want to make sure that we have that presumption and be treated right. Now, 90% of the time, we don't get that same treatment. That's right. Um, but we do have that protection that whether or not we're treated right, ultimately, we will have the right to have our case heard in a court of law. And essentially, that's what Derek Chauvin chose to do. Now, a lot of decisions go into that. And many of you know, and some of you, I'm sure, how many of you have actually personally had, and I'm going to exclude you because you talked about yours, but other than our presenters earlier, how many of you have ever had an interaction with a police officer in terms of a potential conflict? So we see a lot of hands. So many of you know, you know, how, how difficult that could be. And you saw the same thing here, where you had a intervening action that happened here, which was, and many people now have seen that video, where George Floyd went into a store, made a purchase, and eventually there was an allegation, not by the police, but by one of the uh, store managers, that he passed the $20 bill. Now, you can ask yourself, okay, 
George Floyd on all of the videotapes you see wasn't running out the store or anything like that, right? I mean, if you know you're passing a $20 bill, you're going to pass the bill, get your goods, and try to get out of there as quick as you can. So, and we heard the uh, store clerk actually testify in the Chauvin case that at the end of the day, he believed that Derek, that, <laughs> that George Floyd may not have even realized that what he did was pass a $20 bill. So if you follow the evidence, ask yourself, how do we get from this allegation of a potential fraudulent $20 bill to the full encounter of what happened with George Floyd, it doesn't make any sense. And at the end of the day, are we saying that George Floyd's life was only worth $20? Mm. Right? Because even as a police officer, you're responding to a situation of an alleged $20. <laughs> you know, how does that put you in a frame of mind that you're going to end up, you know, having your knee on someone's neck while they're crying and telling you they cannot breathe for nine minutes and 20 some odd seconds? It's, 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 you just can't fathom that. So how many of you have been watching the trial? Okay, so you've seen a number of witnesses come forward. Uh, many of the witnesses are what are called um, eyewitnesses who witnessed what was going on, including some of those who actually did some of the videotaping. And then this week you began to see some of the uh, more official witnesses, both like the medical examiners and the police officers. And all of the testimony, and it's pretty striking, frankly, but all of the testimony, even from the police officers, have said that Derek Chauvin acted illegally and with excessive force, was unreasonable, and that's key, because the law in these situations is whether or not an officer acted in that situation as any other reasonable officer would. So what's truly significant about what's happening is you have all of these police witnesses saying that his conduct was not reasonable and it was unreasonable. but pursuant to the police protocols uh, in that jurisdiction. And frankly, it's been very damaging testimony. Now, again, at the end of the day, nothing is ever anything until the jury comes in. Because in a criminal trial, uh, you have a courtroom that has a judge that presides, and in a jury trial situation, the judge is, is the judge. Obviously, the judge has to manage the courtroom. But also, the judge is the final arbiter, meaning the decision maker, with regard to issues of the law. So if there are any legal issues that come up, that's for the judge to decide. And when you're watching the case, you occasionally will see an objection, and you'll hear the judge say, you know, overrule, or, or no, you can, you can, uh, you know, you can, you can continue. And, and you'll see what's called sidebars, and you've seen a lot of those. And that's when the court is deciding some legal issue uh, that's happening, and that's the purview of the judge. The jury, in a jury case, is the sole determiner of the facts. 
So eventually, when this case, as it says, is given to the jury, they will be the ones that have to make the factual decision as to whether or not Derek Chauvin is guilty of third degree, second degree murder or manslaughter, because those are the three charges against him. And again, we've not seen uh, the defense case, and in every case, once again, when a case goes to court, the prosecutor, and I know I'm probably saying things that you all know very well already, but for the sake of it, I'm, I'm just establishing. So when you go to court, the prosecutor has what's called the burden of proof. And, you know, there are several levels of burden of proof. In a criminal case is the highest burden, and that is you have to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. It's the highest level of proof that, it, that there is, because you have, you know, other levels of proof, um, which could be anything from the weight of the evidence to reasonableness. Um, but proof beyond a reasonable doubt is the highest level of proof and is the proof that's used in a jury trial. And so at the end of the day, the jurors who will hear all of the evidence then have to decide whether the prosecutor met his burden or her burden uh, or whatever pronoun may be applicable <laughs> uh, has met the burden of proof in the case because the prosecutor has the obligation to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And again, we've not seen uh, the defense attorneys do their case yet because the prosecutors are still in their case, but you've begun to see a hint of what the defense is going to try to do. And, you know, sometimes in a case where, <laughs> you know, there really is no hope, uh, you may have to start grabbing at things to try to establish. And we can see in this case what the defense is going to try to establish, and you heard some compelling testimony with regard to the life of George Floyd, including from his girlfriend, which was riveting and very emotional and very compelling, uh, and, and, and did a tremendous job of humanizing uh, who George Floyd is. And the difficulties that people have in life with regard to the battles with various kinds of addiction. And so again, there's no dispute that George Floyd used drugs. You know, um, one can be critical, judgmental about all of that, but at the same time, the testimony showed that he struggled with this and he obviously did things to try to fight his addiction. And so the defense is certainly going to try to use of uh, the fact, and, and, and they'll have medical evidence coming in, and again, if you were watching any of the trial today, you saw some of that evidence begin to come in, where they're going to try to make a medical case to the jury that George Floyd may have died because of some drug use. The prosecutors, of course, are going to push back on that, and they're going to have a lot to work with. Because not only have you had the police officers who have testified that it's inappropriate, not only do you have the police officers that have testified that it's inappropriate um, 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 of what Derek Chauvin did, but you've also had some of those questions directed at the medical examiner, and the medical examiner will also address some of that. So that's kind of where the case is at, and that's where the case is coming to. Uh, it's been a very compelling case, and 
you know, we, we have all been involved in a lot of these cases, and I truly have to say that I, I'm remarkably surprised at how candid the police officer testimony in this case has been. And, you know, you never know what a jury is going to do. That's why they say it's not over until it's over, and you have to hold your breath until the end of this case, because at the end of the day, the prosecutor needs all 12 jurors who actually deliberate to vote guilty in order to have Chauvin found guilty. Derek Chauvin, he needs one juror, right. just one, and then you have a mistrial, and then you, you know they're going to have to either start all over or something else will happen. So with that said. Police go to the regular prison um, as everyone else. They go to whichever prisons are in that state. Now, you know, sometimes, you know, even in prison, they can have different wings occasionally where they put um, segregated uh, individuals who may be uh, challenged or should not be in what's called general population. Uh, but a lot of times, that'll, that's up to the defendant, too. Um, but yeah, if he's convicted, uh, he will go to whichever of the state prisons in Minnesota um, that they send him to. Uh, so my question is, as you said before, that the uh, chief of police and a lot of police officers are speaking out against him during the trial. <coughs> How does that now impact the defense on now trying to guess, show that he's still innocent? Say that again? That, like you said before, saying how the police officer and chief of police are saying that their actions was not um, was not adequate, is not correct, he should never have done that. How is that now impacting the defense with their... Well, what's really significant about that is, again, at the end of the trial, the court is going to do what is called instruct the jury. And what that is, is the judge will instruct the jury. How many of you have ever sat on a jury? I mean, oh, that's a good representation. Now, was those criminal cases or civil cases? What, how many criminal cases? All right, the others were civil cases. All right, remember, civil cases are very different than criminal cases. But uh, in the criminal case, uh, at the end of the case, and after all of the closing arguments and everything has happened, um, because that's how trials happen, um, you know, there's the prosecution's case, there's the defense case, there's rebuttal, and then it closes. Both sides make their arguments, and then the court charges the jury. That's instructing them on the law. And the judge will have to instruct them what the elements of each of the causes of action are against Chauvin. So he'll instruct them on the elements of manslaughter, murder two, and murder three, and then the jury has to decide whether or not the prosecution has proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt on each of those uh, elements within those charges. And also, if any of you guys have questions, you can also come up and ask them. Um, and a question that I had is, what Derek was doing was wrong. He had his knee on his neck for about 9 minutes and 29 seconds. And what I want to ask, what if a uh, civilian or a bystander that was seeing what, was, uh, what he was doing was wrong, what if there was a being um, and what the officer was doing, what would have happened then? What if, what if a civilian, somebody that was watching what was happening, would have intervened in that um, altercation? Well, I mean, um, if, if one of the civilians had intervened, any number of things could have happened, including something really dangerous, which is that the other officers could possibly have justified using deadly physical force against anyone who would have tried to attack Derek Chauvin while he was interacting with George Floyd. Um, 
because the officers could potentially presume that Derek Chauvin was then in danger, and potentially they could say that I had reason to use deadly physical force. So it could have been a very challenging situation. And you heard a number of the eyewitnesses say that they occasionally backed off because, you know, they were concerned for their own safety. Uh, good evening, Mr. Hardy. How are you doing? I'm Bart Nevins. Um, <laughs> the reason uh, I had a question, and uh, essentially, um, I know someone very close to the overall situation, and uh, the person did express that they are starting to see uh, a lot of, uh, I guess, buildings and so on and so forth brought it up, mm. similar to how it was done with Jacob Blake's uh, case, similar to Breonna Taylor's case, and we all know how those ended up. So um, I know we live in a society yeah. that is dictated by rules, um, by the Constitution, so on and so forth, but how much of this is just an elaborate show? Mm. And how much of this is actually just a farce because they ultimately are not, not gonna pretty much rule this person to be guilty, no matter how much evidence is put forth like it was in previous cases? Mm. You know, again, uh, having witnessed a lot of these trials and having done some of these trials myself, you know, I, I would really say, and I said it earlier, I'm, I am shocked as to how um, candid the police testimony in this yeah. case has been. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have never, normally in these police cases, when you call all of the official witnesses, and when I say official witnesses, I mean everyone from other police officers to the medical examiners to any kind of other official that might have been involved from a governmental point of view in processing the arrest, you know, even the medical examiners. Mm -hmm. They will always, always try to hedge on the witness stand. Mm. Right. They will, you know, usually the prosecutor will ask a direct question and you could you can almost see in almost every other trial we've been in, they will bend over backwards to try to uh, manage their testimony in a way that is not hurtful to the police officer. Right. In this case, the police officers have all come in and said he basically disgraced this department and acted as a criminal and killed George Floyd. So, you know, again, the toughest thing here is that at the end of the day, he needs one juror that says, I have a reasonable doubt. Mm. And you have to remember, the juror that says, I have a reasonable doubt, they do not have to explain that oh, wow. to anybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So long as their doubt, and they can maybe sit in front of a judge and you ask them, mm -hmm. you know, did you consider, yes, I considered it. And you say, you had, yes, I had a reasonable doubt. Cannot ask you why. Mm. Mm -hmm. Say, I heard all the evidence, I mm. you know, mm. it's just something you can't, you know, you can't, you can't question what a jury may do. Mm. But I'm going to tell you, um, and, you know, if you've ever, again, for those that have been in jury rooms, mm. um, it's amazing, and I think I actually said this to Reverend Sharpton, again, many of you have watched the trial. And you can almost get a sense of kind of why reality TV, mm -hmm. because reality TV really grew out of kind of the court TV era mm -hmm. when people started Absolutely. watching these real trials. Because it's just striking the way ordinary, everyday people are dealing with their own lives. 
And so you've seen that on this trial. You've seen some of these witnesses who were just so compelling, mm -hmm. both the civilian witnesses and the police witnesses. So you just, you know, you just have to believe that any juror that's a part of this, you know, is not going to want to make a decision, or you hope. Let me put it this way. Mm. Again, you can only hope. Mm -hmm. You know, making a decision on someone's guilt or innocence is probably one of the most significant decisions you'll ever make in your life. And if nothing else, you want to be able to look yourself in the mirror and say, I made the right decision right. that I can justify. And that's all you can hope for. Amen. Thank you. All right. So um, a popular item, I want to say all of us have smartphones with cameras. So in most interactions with law enforcement, when you begin to take out your phone and begin recording the exchange with the officer, and the officer tells you or asks you to put that away and stop recording, do you have the right to do so, or can you continue? Officer can't recording? tell you to put your phone away and stop recording. So long as, again, let me be clear now, you have an absolute right, so long as you are not interfering with the work of the police officer. And interfering means that you are keeping a legitimate distance, and sometimes, you know, the police will mark off a barrier. And so long as you're not encroaching on that barrier, they can't make you stop. And if you do encroach on that barrier, like someone was asking, could some individual intervene? Well, even if the police don't kill you, <laughs> You might be arrested because, you know, there's a there's a criminal uh, charge that's called obstruction of governmental administration in New York and in everywhere. It probably may have a slightly different name, but you know, you're you as a civilian, you cannot interfere with the official duties of a police officer and obstruct their administration of the law, and you can be charged for that. Thank you, Attorney Hardy. I have a question for you. So they said that George Floyd was killed for a $20 bill. Now, working in retail from back in the day, they used to always tell us that you can't question a customer and that the store has insurance to get that counterfeit money back. Right. So can't that be like a main part of the trial? Because for $20, the store wouldn't even take the loss. Yeah, but, well, it has been, and, and they had testimony from the store clerk. And the store clerk, you know, obviously the store clerk didn't challenge George Floyd with regard to accepting the $20 and giving him his merchandise. But then when he discussed it with the manager, they decided to report that they believed that it was a fake $20 bill. And um, as he said on the stand, that in hindsight, he felt most guilty because he felt like he should have simply not accepted the $20. Mm, all right. Right. You know, which the clerk could do. You've been in stores where you give them a 20 and they, they either color it or look at it. If they don't like it, they can hand it back to you and say, I need another bill. And that, you, you can't say you have to take that bill. Then they'll say, no, we don't, you know. Thank you, Attorney Hardy, first of all. This is so insightful, and it's so crazy. A real quick comment. I've had a fake $100 bill, and I didn't even know it was fake until they tested it, and thankfully, I didn't get killed. So these things that are happening, I feel like sometimes it's a personal thing with some of these officers, but it is what it is. Uh, we're going to stay in prayer. So I just wanted to get up and um, you know just share those sentiments that it's just not fair what's going on. But one of the things that uh, caught my attention is a few years ago, speaking about our dear, you know, Eric Garner, the young man that recorded, right, he ended up going and doing time. And this young lady who recorded, thankfully, she's still out. I, I'm trying to figure out because she tried her best to intervene. And as we saw, like, they would not listen to her or anybody else. But I just wanted to know what was the difference because at the end of the day, it's almost similar, but it's not. And it's unfortunate in both cases, but... I don't know if you have any insight on that. 
Well, I mean, the difference is the woman in the George Floyd case was just filming. The person in the Eric Garner case had other issues that had nothing to do with Eric Garner. And he went to he went to jail on other issues. Okay. I have a quick question. I saw part of the testimony from the Minneapolis chief, chief of police. Yep. And the part that I really am glad that I got to see and hear personally was this testimony based on the policy which is actually shown on the screen, showing what is necessary to de-escalate right. a situation. And there were certain points that were emphasized. I cannot recall all of them. But what I can recall was the physical ability of the person, the mental ability, and what was very important for me to really remember was drug or alcohol. So basically what I concurred was if they really understand that the person that they are attempting to arrest may be under the influence of drugs or alcohol, they are still professionally responsible for de-escalating the situation. So with that, knowing that the defense is going to use the allegation that George Floyd used drugs and that may have been the alleged cause of his death, when you talk about this one person, one juror, that may not agree with a guilty verdict, can the judge particularly ask that alleged juror, which I no, hope doesn't no, happen, did, no. you, did you listen to the chief? They can't go to a particular witness no. and say, oh, what? No. Oh. Okay, thank you. But let me answer the other part of your question because some people may not have realized it. One of the interesting things in that testimony is that you saw the chief was saying what all he testified to the prosecution along what those guidelines were, including all of the necessary elements of de-escalation. When you saw the defense attorney get up, you saw him ask the chief, say, well, chief, there are different ways to de-escalate that are in the policy. Is that, he said, yes, there is. And he said one of those ways to de-escalate is potentially an officer showing his weapon, yeah. right? And he said, yes, that's one of the ways. And then he said, this is the defense attorney, and then he said, and also you can de-escalate by other uses of force. And it was really interesting. And this is, again, you know, in the subtleties of a trial where you say, wow. The chief paused. He looked the defense attorney in the eye and looked at the jury and said, no, I am not aware, basically, of situations where physical force is considered any kind of de-escalation. That was a very critical part. And you could tell that the chief, to his credit, again, I'm, I am astounded by the candor and honesty, well, let me not say honesty, I'm certainly <laughs> struck by the candor of the testimony of these police officers. Because if he was trying to help Derek Chauvin, he would have gone along with the yeah, defense attorney. That's right. But he didn't. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, attorney Lottie, my question is that, is there, as, a, as a, an attorney, is there any way the defense can break down the charges because of the jargon used in the law to try to escape certain charges and only get the first or the second or third degree? Also, the question I have is, are the, oh, there were three officers that was there. Let's not forget about that. They have pushed Derek Chauvin in. He is the killer, but those two should be criminally culpable also. Well, they, have, they are charged, and their, their trials will also happen. Their trials were segregated from the Chauvin trial, mm -hmm. 
so that we don't have uh, basically cross-contamination with regard to the potential guilt of the individual officer. So they severed, they severed those cases out. Because you're not getting diminished by a whole lot of distraction with regard to sort of the lesser charges that would be against the other officer. Because then you're in a situation where the jury is thinking not guilty for some of the other officers, and you never know how that could flow over to the main case. Thank you very much. I'll let's talk to you. Great counsel. Yes, sir. Well, my personal experience is that at the um, trial reach the conclusion, the main thing being how the judge is going to charge the jury. I've seen some let's play out in some of the court cases based on what confusion interpretation what the judge be hearing and what he's going to put before the jury on which way they're going to come back, number one. And number two, about these police officers. I've seen some mess with uh, police officers. Yeah, if you know, that, you know um, acting what they call a radical, a radical uh, way, they would take you to the hospital and put you in a psych ward and you come up with a story, well, you were so irrational that you tell your mind that you used to threat to yourself, that was rebellion, that's why we did what we did. And I'm going to see how it's going to play out this particular trial, because it seems like the judge is going to use that on the drug angle, that the drug is influence, that he would not control himself. And then the um, judge going to use that, um, to maybe the charge to the jury, that he brought this upon himself. There's a possibility to that. No, I mean, no, it, de it depends on, again, you know, the, look. A, a, a court has the obligation to charge a jury, mm -hmm. one, with regard to the actual elements of the actual charges, right? Manslaughter, second degree, third degree murder. But they also charge the jury on, you know, on, you know, the issues of, of how to understand questions, you know, what, what are reasonable, um, you know, what are reasonable deductions from the evidence. So the best example that they often use, that if you were on a jury and a person came in to testify and he had his raincoat and umbrella and they were totally wet, you can make a reasonable assumption that it was raining outside. Mm -hmm. Right? Because just from the evidence. Um, so, you know, the jurors are instructed on how to make those kinds of, you know, decisions and how to distinguish uh, between certain elements of the case and where they're allowed to, you know, use their reason and make reasonable deductions from the evidence and where they can't. And in this case, let me again, just in this case, the video evidence, yeah. there's no video evidence, frankly, suggesting that at any time before George Floyd was put in restraint that he acted erratic or anything else. Thank you. So it's, it, it really shouldn't be, in my view, it shouldn't really be that much of an issue in front of the jury. Right. Right. I mean, you can't just make stuff up and give it to a jury just because you're a judge. Can we give a round of applause? I'm going to get a round of um, information, not only just about the case, but about, you know. Our Sorry wife. if I talk too long. No, shoot, I feel like I got a whole law degree now. I, I love it. I love it. Right? Let's talk about the game. I got the same I also want to give a special thanks to the panel for coming out and speaking. You know, there's been a lot of other allegations, so it's good that we still are fighting for those, and we'll always keep fighting for you guys. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, that was time for dinner, unless, Ashley, would you like to say? Oh yeah, you could also just about the action or something.
Okay, so I, um, we are having a rally, One Police Plaza, 1 o'clock. National Action Network and the Martin Luther King Jr. Democratic Club is partnering with us for the rally. Um, again, we are the Stop Force Police Reporting Group. You can go to change.org, type in Stop Force Police Reporting. You can also visit our Facebook page, Stop Force Police Reporting. Um, our individual stories are on the Facebook page. And uh, we hope to see you at the rally. Again, strength in numbers. So our action is that we are pushing for legislation to make false police reporting by either a civilian or a police officer a felony conviction because we want people to stop weaponizing false reports. We know that civilians will use the 911 system to make the false report. So it's not only a criminal matter. We see false re reporting all the time. We see people being pushed out of housing based on false reports. We see false reports through ACS, right, removals of children. So there are various levels of false reporting that this legislation is targeting. Right? So we want to stop and eradicate the process of false reporting by civilians and officers. So we need for people to begin to push the agenda of stop false police reporting. We need legislation, we need the support, because without the legislation, it will just fall flat and people will just continue to do it. Lives are lost, right? Think about the ramifications of people having to defend their name, defend their honor. They have to lose time away from their job. They have to go back and forth to court in order to prove their, their, their innocence, right? That was something that we talked about tonight. So please support us, support our initiative, and come to the rally on Sunday. Thank you. All right, guys, see you on Sunday. Come out. Thank you, everyone, for coming. You know, there's school, so come in and just have some food.